What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys and gals, what's going on? Don't ever wait for your doctor to order blood tests. With Private MD Labs, you can get your blood test prescription online in under one minute and go directly to over 4,000 lab locations in the United States. They offer every blood test imaginable at affordable prices with highly accurate results from tried and true state-of-the-art blood testing diagnostics. In fact, I've been using Private MD Labs for more than a decade. Their blood tests are much more in-depth and accurate than any at-home pinprick or worthless saliva test. Skip the intrusive doctor questions and get the exact tests that I recommend. Be proactive and get your panels today. Go to privatemdlabs.com forward slash JC to take 15% off your order. Send you guys love and light. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world, I am Jay Campbell. And of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio with a good friend of mine, Dr. Kenneth Wilgers. Kenny, what's up, brother? How are you? How are you doing, brother? Okay, so guys, let me give you Ken's bio. Uh, It's very long and illustrious, but he is one of us. He is the owner of Optimus VIP Health in Montgomery, Texas, and also the Wilgers Clinic in Beaumont, Texas. He lives in Montgomery, Texas with his wife, Holly, and enjoys spending time with his eight children and four grandchildren. That's amazing, bro, by the way. My dad had nine. Oh, wow. Actually, my mom had 10, and the guy before me died of SIDS. So sometimes I feel like I was an avenging angel slash human coming out to def- defend his, you know, quote unquote, vaccine related injury that was caused by SIDS. Oh, that's a whole nother story for another day, but uh, that's yeah, awesome. I'm over it. Yeah, you're over. Uh, when you have so many kids though, you never have to explain to anybody what you do for fun. That's right. That's yeah. right. My, people used to say to my dad when we were growing up and I was a little kid, they'd be like, Mr. Campbell, are you, are you rich? And he'd be like, I'm rich in kids. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let me just say, first off, that Kenny is a good friend of mine and he is definitely one of the top optimization physicians in the, on the planet. Um, I've known Kenny now, what, going back seven years. Um, okay. He has worked with Dr. Neil Rougier. You know, he's in the same networks, all the top docs, Dr. Rob, Dr. Keith, you know, all the guys that you know, know what's going on in this. So I, this, is a, this podcast is a long time coming and we're going to talk about stuff that the field of interventional endocrinology really for the most part gets wrong. Kenny, what would you say the percentage of doctors that actually understand this are less than 1%? Oh yeah. That's generous. By the way, guys, Kenny is very dry. So like you're going to hear some funny things today probably, but he's serious. So don't think he's not serious when he talks about this. Okay. So real quick, we're going to talk about topics um, that most people again, don't understand, which is, polycythemia versus erythrocytosis. Uh, We will get into estrogen. We'll probably talk a little bit about thyroid. uh, And then depending on how much time we have, which I will bring him on another podcast to talk about physiologic versus pharmacologic dosing of hormones, which is a very new, or or I should say, uh, not as well understood um, topic. And we will, but we will get that. So let's, so let's just set, let me set you up. Um, you sent me an email, obviously, for the outline on this to talk about how surrogates, surrogates and extrapolations in medical practice and why doing that kind of stuff is horrible. And I will just say that, you know, I've been saying this for a decade now that, you know, th- th- it's the same correlation to studies, right? Like people want to use studies of comorbid population groups. When you and I both know that you and I are N of one and biochemically unique and individual and that studies for that, for the most part are, are worthless because you can never replicate a study because of all people's biochemical individuality. So with surrogates and extrapolations, talk a little about why extrapolations are not good. So, um, you know, it started out with surrogates because surrogates are necessary. Um, and I'll explain those in just a second, but extrapolations, 
you know, the easiest way to do it is if you're looking at a number line and if you see one, three, blank, seven, nine, well, you know that that num the blank should be five. Right. And that's yeah. interpolation because it fits. Extrapolation would be if you had one, three, seven, blank, 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 blank. Well, who knows? So, you know, one to three is Not two, three to seven is four. Well, maybe the next one is 15 because it's eight, but you don't know for sure. So extrapolation is taking a little bit that you know and then taking a leap of faith to this new idea. Um, specifically in medicine, you take a concept that we know is true in one situation and then extend it to another situation. And we'll see that today when we talk about erythrocytosis, we do the exact same thing with estrogen. So extrapolations are never good because you never know. Right. Surrogates can be necessary. Like um, when you're talking about kidney, kidney function, we use creatinine as a measure for kidney function. Well, creatinine has nothing to do with the kidneys. Creatinine is something that's produced by muscle contractions. It's a byproduct. Um, but what we know is that the kidneys control the internal environment. So your sodium, your chloride, your fluid, your glucose, kidneys are constantly changing what they, what they uh, filter in order to make your internal environment correct. And there's one thing that we know of that the kidneys filter at a constant rate all the time, and it's creatinine. Right. And so that being said, if your creatinine goes up, your kidneys are probably filtering less. If your creatinine goes down, they're probably filtering more. That's great until you have somebody who's taking creatine. Right. So their Which production of creatinine are. goes up, and their yeah. filtration stays the same, but there's some egghead somewhere that's going to say, oh, they've got grade three kidney failure because the creatinine went to 1.6. And it's their kidneys are working fine. They're just taking in more creatine. Um, so when you use a surrogate, you have to be careful. Same thing with hemoglobin A1C with, in diabetes. Um, that measures the percentage of red blood cells that have sugar attached to them. That's great, but it still doesn't tell you how your diabetes is doing overall because one big party, a uh, big birthday party, can cause your A1C to go up and then it right. doesn't come down for three months. And so right. you have to be careful with those things, but sometimes they're necessary. Now, yeah, well said. Now, bad examples, which we're going to talk about today, and we can just go, you know, our polycythemia, estrogen, even to, even uh, some of our our uh, policies in thyroid. But starting out with, you know, poly polycythemia versus erythrocytosis. One of the things that completely turns me inside out is when somebody comes in and says, hey, I'm on testosterone. What happens if I get thick blood? Right. And the first thing I think of is thick head, but no, um, there's no such thing. And I'm telling you that there are, there are oncologists, hematologists, critical care specialists, internal medicine people out there, cardiologists, they're all going to tell you that I'm the one with the thick head today, Right. that, that there is thick blood. But um, this is all, again, extrapolation. The term polycythemia comes from a condition, a genetic condition, which right. is a polymorphism of a specific gene called JAK2. And the people that have this have an overproduction in their bone marrow of red blood cells, white blood right. cells, and platelets. Right. And they also have inflammatory issues, increased CRP, increased cytokines, hypercoagulability. And these people typically lose fingers and toes by the time they're in right. their 20s. And they, a lot of them die of major strokes by the time they're 50. And um, so then when you take testosterone and your red blood cells go up, somebody goes, oh, you've got polycythemia. You need to go bleed yourself out or you're going to have a stroke. There's so much wrong with that that we're going to get into. Um, but that, that's a huge extrapolation. And our major problem now is that 80 to 90 percent of knowledgeable hormone replacement doctors and alternative medicine doctors and people in the, you know, in the functional medicine space still believe that. And they will argue with me to the death in spite of the evidence. Right. And so I'm going to try and touch on the high points of that today to get everybody to understand when your doctor says you got to go bleed yourself out. Uh, not only is that unnecessary, but it's also it also can be dangerous. And we can get into exactly why. So let's, let's talk about that. Let's de let's define that a little bit. Just begin for people clinicians especially 
what is the difference between erythrocytosis and polysemia? I mean, you already just said polysemia is a genetic condition, but like, why do, where does it come from a lack of awareness of understanding the differentiation? So going back to the root of the word, the, the Latin poly meaning many, cyto meaning cells, emia meaning blood, many cells in the blood. Um, if you look at, let's say somebody has a, um, a pure increase in platelets. Those are called thrombocytes and it's called thrombocytosis. A pure increase in white blood cells. Those are called leukocytes, leukocytosis. Increase in red blood cells. Those are called erythrocytes. And somebody says, oh, polycythemia. Well, where the heck did that come from? That's erythrocytosis. It's secondary erythrocytosis because it's something else. And the research deals with that. But again, I don't understand the people that even begin to call it polycythemia, because again, it's not. Polycythemia is an increase in the blood of many cell types, not just red blood cells. And so pure erythrocytosis is elevation in red blood cells. And go to any basic hematology textbook and look and see if there's any reference anywhere to red blood cells causing clots. Right. They don't. Platelets cause clots. Right. Clotting factors cause clots. Red blood cells don't. So that's the first problem. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, I mean, I, I, you know, again, going back four or five years, you know, I remember listening to Neil lecture, you know, about the guys at altitude, right. Who routinely Correct. have, you know, hemoglobin and hematocrit levels that are quote unquote off the charts. And we, we got to phlebotomize them. And, you know, the evidence proved that none of that was the case. And it doesn't, it's just doesn't seem to take hold, you know, in medicine at the, inertia of the big ship of allopathic you know care where it just like nobody still figures this out i mean do you see you know a shift at any point in time or is this still going to be you know kind of lead from the front like we're doing right now and just put it out there because you know like you said when this goes out there we'll be attacked these right. guys don't know what they're talking about I'm, I'm seeing you know just on the subject of estrogen <clears throat> excuse me um just looking at some things for this podcast there are a lot of newer studies out there on estrogen where they're kind of, you know, going, yeah, maybe that might be a thing. We don't need to block estrogen in guys. And I think we're gaining some ground with that. Um, with this, I think it's going to be a little tougher, um, basically because the, the majority of things that cause your red blood cells to go up will cause you harm. Right. And, you know, you've got polycythemia vera that we just talked about. Red blood cells go up. Now, where do those numbers come from? The, 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 threshold you know you look yeah. at some of these uh testosterone studies and they say well you know even morgenthaler if the red blood cells if their hematocrit's over 55 you might want to consider stopping testosterone or you know therapeutic phlebotomy well in polycythemia vera because it's very difficult to bleed people down to certain platelet levels when you're following platelets they use red blood cells as the standard and the initial treatment for polycythemia was therapeutic phlebotomy. You bleed people out, they clot less. And right. it's because you're getting rid of clotting factors, you're getting rid of platelets. There's a lot of right. things that happen when you bleed people out. Right. And they found that under a hematocrit under 55 dramatically reduced the amount of clotting in people with polycythemia. Right. So somebody said, well, and you know, in testosterone therapy, you need to stay below 55. Same thing. Right. You know, and again, that's an extrapolation. The yeah. other things that cause harm, red blood cells go up in, in anything that reduces oxygen. So you talked right. about about um, elevation, and we'll get to that in a little while, but chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. People with right. chronic lung disease, their hematocrit will go to, you know, we talked about 55, their hematocrit will go to 70. Yep. And ask any ER doc, if somebody comes in with COPD with a hematocrit of 70, do they need to phlebotomize them? And the answer will be no, because you'll kill them. Right, they need exactly. the red blood cells to move the oxygen. Right. Now, the increase in cardiovascular events we see in people with COPD is because they got COPD. Right. They got COPD because they either were long-term smokers or they've got some type of a cardiovascular issue or some other inflammatory disorder, and there's high inflammation in these people. Right. And they're right. very likely to clot no matter what their hematocrit is. Um, and then smokers, smokers will have numbers 
at that level? And do we even need to discuss the harm there? <laughs> I was about to say, bro, yeah. who still smokes? Today? Right. And so, you know, we don't even need to discuss that harm. You know, my, my wife said something the other day that I'd never really thought about because I always talk to people about about their uh, red blood cell levels and talk about, you know, at height. You know, does everybody in Denver get a blood clot? Well, I had somebody call the other day because he wanted therapeutic phlebotomy and he said he went to Life Share Blood Center and they wouldn't draw his blood because his he had too much iron and they were afraid he had polycythemia, so they didn't want to take his blood, but he could get an order from a doctor and they'll take his blood and throw it away. <laughs> and my wife said, Who's, who gets to donate blood in Denver? Do they like not have a blood supply? Because everybody's got an elevated hematocrit up there right. and the blood centers will immediately turn people away. Does nobody donate blood in Denver? I just, I don't get that. And so, um, but they go, Oh no, you live in Denver. That's why your hematocrit's high. We're not worried about it. Well, Oh no, right. I take testosterone. That's why hematocrit's high. Don't worry about it, but it's different right. for some reason. Right. And, right. you know, so there are things that cause harm and a lot of these things do cause blood clotting and, and other issues. And so, the extrapolation to me is kind of understandable, but yeah. still you got to, you really have to look into it and say, are we, are we really doing what we should do? And is it really necessary? And well, looking well, at the research, it's not. Well, so I would, so I would say this before we knew, you know, going back shit, 2012, 2013, uh, you know, when I was, con when I would consult with guys, you know, in various coaching circles and stuff about this, you know, we would always tell them as long as you're doing your cardio, you know, we knew that injectable testosterone increased blood viscosity and oxygenation mm -hmm. and red blood cells and all that stuff. But we also knew that, you know, just randomly or routinely phlebotomizing guys was a horrible thing as you you know can get into if you want. But I mean, I don't think we need to, we've kind of already established that maybe, maybe you can say why it's not good, but, but at the end of the day, we would always tell them that, are you, or ask, are you doing your cardio? And for the guys that didn't do their cardio, they were the ones that struggled. And, you know, so now we're you know, getting back to the whole idea of like what you've been saying is that, you know, the more cardiovascularly efficient you are by obviously doing cardio, you know, adjusting your lifestyle, sleeping better, eating right, you know, living insulin controlled. Those guys didn't have the problems that were using the injectable testosterone for the guys versus the guys inject using injectable testosterone who didn't do cardio. So there's, there's definitely a correlation to this. And, and so, you know, I would say, and again, extrapolation, but I would say that if, as long as you're doing what you should be doing when you're on therapeutic testosterone, regardless of the delivery system, um, this isn't an issue, Ken. I mean, it really isn't. And so when, when you have docs who don't know, and then, you know, combined with the guys that are living a shitty lifestyle, I mean, it's a, it's a recipe for disaster. Right. So, um, so, you know, since we're talking about safety and, and danger in these different conditions, I'm going to read you a quote from Abraham Morgenthaler, New England Journal of Medicine, 2004. It is reassuring that as far as we can determine, no testosterone associated thromboembolic events have been reported to date. Ever. And I read that to guys and tell them, but you could be the first. So you better go give us some blood. And they all do exactly what you're doing. They laugh and they understand and away they go. And they might come in again in a couple months and I might have to tell them the same thing because some of them do get hung up on that. And they have a friend that's a doctor they're working out with that goes, man, you know, you can be careful. You're going to get a stroke. But no, no events reported to date. And so how in the world, you know, if you look at the research too, the testosterone studies, when you read them, no matter what their core uh, focus is, you can always tell if, if the authors are pro or con testosterone right. by their attitudes and different things. But in yeah. every single study, when they list erythrocytosis or polycythemia as a side effect of testosterone, which it is, they always follow it up with but the significance of this has, is yet to be determined, or right. we don't know how often this actually happens, but it could potentially happen. Nobody gives any numbers ever. And, and right. if anybody wants to find me that study, um, you know, I'll kiss your butt and give you, give you time to draw a crowd because it's not out there. Hey guys, what's going on?
If you're looking to level up your life from a mind, body, and spiritual perspective, join the Fully Optimized Health private membership group today. There is no better place online to discuss hormones, peptides, fitness, fat loss, supplements, and even raising your consciousness with an elite tribe of men and women. You also get to speak to me directly every single week in the Ask Me Anything. Join today. Go to Fully Optimized Health dot com and sign up and i'll see and talk to you soon well with with erythrocytosis when we know do you ever is there you know as as a clinician is there ever a level that you see where you're you're concerned short answer to that is no right um, hold on say that again i said the short answer to that is no um <laughs> interesting study I've got a bunch of these here, but I, this is one I really love. Now, one of the things I, I try not to do, again, extrapolation. Right. You know, the study about growth hormone and cancer was a study yeah. when you give human growth hormone to rats. And the outcome, you know, the lesson from that study is if you're a rat, don't take gro human growth hormone. Right. You can't exactly. get anything else from that study. But this right. is purely <laughs> physics. Study in blood. Journal 2003, it's called Hemostasis and Coagulation at a Hematocrit Level of 0.85. So these people had wow. a hematocrit of 85, which is wow. unheard of. Right. They had to have these specific transgenic, or I said people, mice. They had these transgenic mice that had a deletion of a gene, and they would just produce red blood cells out the wazoo. And in these mice, they didn't have any blood clots. They didn't have any, wow. any circulation issues. They didn't have any viscosity issues at a hematocrit of 85. 85. And what they found was that at that level, there were reactive forces that nitric oxide increased to inhibit vasoconstriction. Right. Yep. And there were factors that were created that, that inhibited plasma coagulation factors. And so there were no blood clots and they had a hematocrit of 85. And there are studies showing now that, that um, red blood cells when your hematocrit goes up, they will actually deform and change shape to fit through capillaries. And when you look at the sizes of capillaries, uh, a capillary is typically five micrometers, maybe right. a little more. White right. blood cells are 14 to 16 micrometers each. And red blood cells are, are eight to eight to nine micrometer, micrometers. So they're already bigger than capillaries wow. before we start. They go through in single file. So how can you have clumping in the capillaries if they go through single file yeah it just it doesn't happen so wow. unbelievable stuff um, i mean it's it's it, dude it's mind-blowing okay so let's talk before we move to estrogen though let's let's talk a little bit more about because again i want to make this relatable you know so that a, any person who watches this can truly understand like what we're talking about i mean you know you're saying 85 you know for the for the lab ranges for people to understand you know they're panically sending guys to be phlebotomized when they're at 51 or 52. 55. Well, 55, I, mean, but I see guys still, you know, 51, yeah. 52, and they're in a panic, right? Because it's over 50. Right. Do you, is there, what, what type of person, uh, when they're over 55, is a, is a higher risk person? Is, is it just what we already believe it to be that the inflamed person, not, not living a cleanse lifestyle? I mean, I mean, is there anyone? No, you know, I'm hoping you're asking that question because you think somebody else will, and it's not a real question coming from you because right. you should understand that over 55, there's, there's no harm in that. No, I know that, but obviously I am asking for that because that most of these guys don't get that advice. So here's the answer. There is a, a case study in the literature that has actually, uh, if it's my understanding, it's actually been made into a chapter in a hematology book. Um, but the case study is called A Clue in Jack 2. And JAK2 being the gene for polycythemia. Right. And this was a case study of a young gentleman, 20 something, 30 something, that presented to the emergency department with a with an embolic stroke. He had, he had a blood clot, had an embolic stroke, and his hematocrit was 45. And then they did his genetic testing and he had polycythemia. And so again, every time we show all these studies where high, high, high doesn't cause harm. I like to show the one study where the person who's low with the actual condition still has harm. 
because it's not the hematocrit that causes the problem. This guy was 45 and still had a clot. It's the, it's the inflammation, it's the coagulation factors, it's the genetic right. disorder that causes the problem. It's not the numbers. And so, right. no, that's, ne that's never a problem. I do want to mention one thing, because um, we talked about the differences in the different conditions that cause this. Over and over and over again in the literature and when you talk to hematologists, and, and let me tell you, I'm not trying to go against any mainstream doctors. We have the best sick care, health care system in, this, in the world. And if I'm sick, <laughs> if I've got cancer, if I get in trauma, I want to go to the hospital and I want right. the board certified expert because nobody's better at sick care. Right. It's well care right. that we have a problem with. And once you're exactly. once you have no disease, they're done. They don't want to go Can't farther into wellness. So Can't but anyhow, it. when you look at these studies and you talk to these these experts, they all say, well, testosterone causes you to increase your production of erythropoietin, which causes increase in red blood cells. They think that's the mechanism. And there are plenty of studies showing that erythropoietin can increase clotting factors, it increases cytokines, it causes all these problems that can cause your blood to clot. Erythropoietin is a hormone that's normally released from the kidneys that is part of the normal stimulation for you to make normal amounts of red blood cells. And it's been right. purified into an injection to use for pe people with kidney failure and other things. And some people use it, um, you know, as a performance enhancer. Performance enhancer. Oh, you know, that cyclist guy. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, I, I don't think Lance Armstrong ever had a blood clot and he was shooting erythropoietin. <laughs> And his was a heck of a lot higher than 55. And by the way, guys, erythropoietin is EPO in the yeah, performance EPO, community. Yeah. But anyway, continue. But when you look at these things, and I, I pulled a bunch of studies on the harms of EPO and, and all the things it does in people that abuse it. Um, but there was a neat study, 2013, in the Asian Journal of Andrology. They took a bunch of guys from sea level and they took them to the Himalayas. Wow. And they measured all of their all their different factors in their blood sure. to see what causes the, the hematocrit to go up. Right. Turns out when you go to the Himalayas and get in a, not, a low oxygen environment, testosterone spikes. Of course. That's the exact same mechanism. You make more testosterone and the testosterone has a direct stimulatory effect on the bone marrow to cause it to make more red blood cells. Erythropoietin, EPO is not involved. Wow. And that study was was a very well done study. It's a huge study. It, it's been reviewed, and um, testosterone does not does not cause increase in erythropoietin. It causes an increase in red blood cells, like it's supposed to. And nobody in the Himalayas is dropping dead of a stroke, which means right. I'm not, and I'm not worried about it. Well, Kenny, I've been saying this for a long time. I mean, again, the uh, you know, regardless of extrapolation or not, I mean, testosterone increases oxygenation. So why is that not a good thing, especially for people that are literally attempting to live better physically through exercise and, you know, cardiovascular exercise and, you know, resistance and all that. Right. Okay. But just effect on performance and ferritin, because this is, this is the problem. You know, you've got all these people out there writing books about, you know, people that have not enough iron, too much iron, you know, in the blood. And so, you know, the confusion I think for clinicians is like, well, how do I really know what is a problem? Meaning if I'm low iron, I'm too much iron because again, there's all these now books out there that are talking about how, you know, people are carrying too much iron in the blood. Obviously we already right. know efficiency, but like, can you kind of clarify that? a little? Yeah. Bit? So let me tell you where this started. It was about five years ago. I got an email from Neil Rizier and it had a research study attached to it. And he said, what do you think of this? And it was a research study out of Great Britain showing that non anemic women with a ferritin less than 70, have a higher higher incidence of hair loss. I thought, that's pretty interesting. And so I searched the medical literature. I found six other studies. I've got seven studies now that are associating lower levels of ferritin. I understand that most labs, a ferritin of 15 to 300 is normal. Right. But all these studies were less than 70, associated ferritin, low ferritin with hair loss, with fibromyalgia, with chronic fatigue. There are gobs of studies in the biochemistry literature and uh, the, the basic science literature showing that iron deficiency and low ferritin um, affect fertility. They affect pregnancy. Um, these things are extremely important. And so when your ferritin goes low, 
you got a problem and it causes some issues. Well, for the last five years, I've been checking ferritin on everybody. And what I figured out was this. Again, another stupid thing they teach us. Check the, check the CBC. If it's normal, don't worry about it. Don't check iron. If they're anemic, then check iron, check B12, check those things. Ferritin goes first. Every regularly menstruating female that I've seen in my clinic in the last five years that isn't taking iron has a, has a suboptimal ferritin, every single one of them. And I've got women that are 15 years post-menopause that still have suboptimal ferritins because your diet doesn't replace your iron. Right. And all these people are tired, their hair's falling out, they got joint pain. Interesting study, and I've saved this one because anybody who says, well, you know, and I see these guys all the time. Well, when I go give blood, it makes me feel better. So there's gotta be something. Well, yeah, go go take a handful of opiates to make you feel better too. You know, that that's not the, you know, Feeling better while getting healthier is one thing, but something that just makes you feel better, that's not the end all. Bro, I am partial to clinical grade MDMA, just for the record. Oh, there you go. But um, this was in Sports Medicine 2016. It was a study called Effect of Repeated Whole Blood Donations on Aerobic Capacity and Hemoglobin Mass in Moderately Trained Male Subjects. And there were, there were two lessons. Endurance capacity was altered after blood donation in moderately trained people, and the expected increase in capacity after multiple maximal exercise tests was not present. So wow. after a single blood donation for months, they had a decrease in maximal uh, output. And wow. it also showed that a single blood donation decreases ferritin by up to 50%. That's insane. A single So donation. think of all these docs, though, that are literally taking these patients that are on injectable testosterone and phlebotomizing them three times a year. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've got some of them talking about every two months, you know, and he just, you know, I saw a guy today, his hemoglobin, which we've been talking about hematocrit numbers, but hemoglobin, you know, over 17, 17 and a half. Right. You know what? He was 19 and a half and his ferritin was 29. Wow. I said, stop giving blood because you know what happens? You go get blood, your ferritin goes down, your right. hemoglobin is back up in about three or four days. So exactly. if it helps, it only helps for three or four days. What about the, the other couple months that you're not doing it? You know, again, that's another reason why it shouldn't help because it only helps for three or four days. It's crazy. I mean, right. the lack of awareness on this topic itself, this podcast is worth that. So from an advice standpoint, don't get blood, but like, what do you do? If you're a guy and the doc's like forcing you, I mean, we know the answer, right? Find another doctor. But like, I mean, right. like, so, so like, what is your bottom line on this? So, you know, if somebody wants their number to go down and they can't get over it, they got two options. They can, well, three, not check it. Right. That's which I do for a lot of things that. because it has cost you a can of worms. You can go phlebotomize or you can lower your testosterone dose. Now, you can change the form. Injectable testosterone is markedly worse at this. Yes. It increases your hematocrit much more than transdermal testosterone. Right. I know how you feel about this, but testosterone in pellets. Someday yep. you'll meet a doctor that does pellets really well and you'll like them. <laughs> I'm gonna, but, that's what I'm going to edit out of the show. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, one more thing I wanted to say, though, I've, I've got... In Beaumont, Texas, there's a guy that I know. He's a he's a well-known fitness guy. He's got a private gym there. He's had a gym for 20 years. Everybody in Beaumont that's anybody that wants to go get fit goes to his gym. Yes. And he got hung up on this phlebotomizing thing. And I've seen him twice in the last few years in my clinic with iron deficiency anemia because wow. he couldn't keep up with it. Yeah, and then we could give him an iron infusion, and then two months later, he's phlebotomizing again. Right. But – Back in 2017, 2018, I was doing clinical research for a biotechnology company up in Dallas. And one of the things we were looking at were autoantibodies and coagulation factors and cytokines and all these things that, that cause inflammation and potentially cause vascular disease and heart disease in, in patients. Right. And so I was doing these huge panels on a lot of my patients at the time. And I just happened to do one on him when he was anemic. And what I found was interesting. His erythropoietin was through the roof. Right. Because he was given blood. So his kidneys are producing EPO. And what did I just say? That EPO, even in the research on this subject, 
causes all these problems. Yep. We measured all of their clotting factors. All of his clotting factors, his significant clotting factors were all elevated. Wow. His blood was trying its best to clot because it thought that he was bleeding out and dying. Literally because of all the fucking phlebotomies. Right. And so, you know, I've seen the numbers. I used Incredible, to, man. 10 years ago, I was doing all the same stuff. I was yep. sending people, I was writing orders. You know, sometimes I thought, well, maybe it's not that necessary, but maybe with, with this level, we should do it. I was doing that 10 years ago. And it's just, you you only see so much. And then finally go, yeah, then no, I can't do that anymore. Right. Right. So Yeah. But well, I mean, I'm, glad, I mean, I'm just glad you're here talking about this because I mean, I still see, you know, people are so confused on the iron, on the, on the whole iron situation. So by the way, something you said about the women. So what is your recommendation then for women that are perimenopausal, uh, menopausal, postmenopausal from an iron supplementation standpoint? Well, first of all, they need to get checked. Well, obviously if, if your doctor is not checking ferritin, you got to get your ferritin, ferritin checked. By ferritin is really important. And what's funny is most insurance, oh, it's not funny. It's, we, you and I would both know this. Most insurances don't pay for ferritin tests. Right. Medicare doesn't pay for ferritin tests. With even if we, I think they may do it now, but for a while, Mer Medicare wasn't even paying for a ferritin test with a diagnosis of low ferritin. And get your ferritin checked. It's not expensive. Get it above seventy. If you're still having periods, get it above a hundred. Take a, a couple of doses of iron a week just to replace what you're losing. And by the way, what type, what type? Um, you know, there's all kinds of different types of iron out there. Um, well, what do you a, recommend? Like, there's a generic favorite? of an old um, iron supplement called Integra Plus. I like that because there's two different forms of iron in there. Um, and so they're absorbed differently. And most people don't get any gastrointestinal upset with that because that's the big thing with iron is constipation and GI issues. Right. And because there's two two different forms of iron that absorb differently, people don't get an issue with that. Plus, one of the forms of iron in there, I think it's all iron polysaccharide, um, has been shown to replenish ferritin directly instead of filling up with iron and your iron levels go up and up and up and get almost toxic. And then it spills over and slowly your ferritin goes up over a year. Sometimes this will replenish your ferritin in three months. So, so for men, so, so this is amazing information, by the way, but so, so what do you think, I got to ask, what do you think the percentage of women that are iron deficient, you know, per, per, peri and, 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 uh, and pre? Well, like I said, I don't recall ever seeing a woman who's having regular periods that's With not taking iron that didn't have a ferritin less than 70. Incredible. Um, most of them are less than 50, less than 30. And again, there's a lot of menopausal women that still aren't where they need to be because our diets don't replenish it enough. Well, I mean, I was that's what I was just going to say. I mean, let's face it, bro. You and I know that 50 years ago, people cooked and cast iron fucking skillets and pans. Right. There was there was never a need for this. And now, you know, in this instant gratification culture, as you don't don't get me going. I mean, I don't think anybody under the age of 30, if we if we lose power for five days, I think they'll all starve to death. But I mean, I mean, the truth is, is like nobody gets iron, bro. Right. They're just not getting it. Incredible yep. stuff. I right, cook an iron skillet, by the way. So, I mean, we have four really nice ones downstairs that I still buy. It's hilarious. That's a whole nother story. Uh, okay, but I'm gonna so Integra Plus. By the way, men, what what, what about for men? On that, um, you know, most men, if they don't go give their blood away. Don't don't need they're, they're not yeah they're not accumulating too much because again if you if you're not losing blood you can't lose iron exactly if I see a fifty something guy with iron deficiency anemia that isn't going and donating blood every three months he's getting a colonoscopy because he's right. losing blood somewhere and that's right. the that's the place you're going to lose it and not see it right um, but you know any over the counter iron supplement a woman's vitamin with iron guy takes that for a month or two he's going to replenish. Right. And then he doesn't have to worry about it. he's not going to get toxic with that little bit. Right. Um, but most of the time, they, as long as they're not giving their blood away too often, a couple of times a year would be fine. You know, if somebody just wants to, if they're, you know, if they're doing it out of the good, goodness of their heart and they're doing it to save somebody's life, that's fine. But more than that, you know, in the, in the airplane, they say that for a reason. Put your mask on before you help anybody else. If you bleed yourself out and you're, you're unhealthy, you're not going to help anybody else. Do it twice a year. Do it for a long term. Don't get yourself in trouble. 
Hey guys and gals, what's going on? If you're looking to use peptides, make sure you go to my number one source, Limitless Life Nootropics. For healing with BPC-157 and TB-500 or fat loss with ipamorelin, CGC-1295 and AOD-9604 to immunity with TA-1, thymus and alpha-1, Limitless Labs, a huge selection. Go to LimitlessLifeNootropics.com and use my code J15 to take 15% off your purchase. I send you guys tremendous love and light. Awesome advice. All right, let's switch to estrogen. All right, so I have to tell you this to set this up. So guy follows me, you know, paid for a consult. You know, we spoke. He's a very well-to-do guy in San Diego. That's all I'll tell you about him. And uh, he consulted with Ramasamy at Miami about fertility because, you know, he wants, he knows he needs to start and he wanted to understand the best way to do it. And, you know, so Ramasamy was like, oh, well, you know, I have a nasal thing and, and the guy's a really smart guy. And he's like, I'm not doing the fucking nasal. I had a, a, a surgery. What is that called? Where you have a, you know, that cleft thing. And so he had the, oh yeah, I had a cleft valve repair. Yeah. yeah. So he had, so he had that surgery. So he's like, I can't do anything at nasal. So he's like, all right. So Ramasamy was like, well, why don't you just talk to Jay? And, you know, there's a guy out in San Diego who's a sexual, a well, a sexual wellness expert that if that's where you choose and I'll just connect you with him. So. I swear, and I already told you this off air, so I'll just say it again. So this guy, dude, is a very, you know, again, world-renowned, famous sexual wellness medicine doc. And his labs were, he, and by the way, he's never used therapeutic testosterone before, but uh, he, he he has a serious deficiency now and he's losing his hair and blah, 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 blah. He's stressed out from his bit, the, world, the work he does in the world. But uh, he started taking a fucking, you know, bullshit testosterone booster and, Tong Khan Ali and, you know, all the nonsense you already know. I don't have to say it. And, and so he, his first labs were 14. He had a 14 cents of estradiol pool, which is not, which is pretty low naturally anyway. And then he took those supplements and he was fine. I swear to God, Ken, this is the truth. He sent the labs it was two months apart from taking the, literally the test boosters for two months. He sent the labs to this expert in San Diego and the guy's recommended treatment. I mean, you know, this isn't going to be a surprise to you was literally uh, an AI. A fucking AI, right? With a five sensitive estradiol pool. So I say that to let the people watching this show, and this isn't new to you or me, but like the average clinician still has no fucking, I'll use the word because it's how powerful it is, concept of the importance of estrogen when we're attempting to balance and optimize hormones. Why is that? Well... I can go through the history of it. B bottom line, and I don't want to step on anybody's toes, um, especially anybody in our industry. You know, one of the things that I don't like is, you know, you've got A4M and AMMG and all these, and they're pointing fingers at each other. And as long as we're fighting amongst ourselves, the mainstream is going to win every time. Exactly. But there was a an article before I ever started doing all this BHRT stuff. I read it. I got it from the vitamin shop. It was in Life Extension magazine, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a huge medical journal, but it was written by one of the original Cenogenics guys. Was it Doctor Light? No, no, it might have been it might have been Leak or, or one of those guys. It wasn't Life. Got it. Um, but I can't even remember who it was at the time because I didn't know those guys at the time. Right. But it was in response to at the time Cenogenics was the biggest testosterone pusher right. in the country yep. and the mainstream didn't like them and mainstream right. was saying look testosterone is killing guys testosterone right. causing problems heart attacks right and so the best i can the best i can figure is this article was written to legitimize themselves sure. and it talked right. about you know there are a lot of reports of harm with testosterone however testosterone is not the problem it's a, the aromatization to estrogen and if you stop that, then testosterone is completely safe. And I think, I really think that everybody grabbed that and ran with it because that was the yeah. biggest group in the country at the time. Most of those guys are still will not let go of their estrogen. I, I mean, of their aromatase inhibitors, um, you know, some brilliant, brilliant hormone doctors that I know still are have to take a whiff of aromatase inhibitor or they feel like they're just not going to make it. And at this point, is that science or is that religion? You know, what, what, what uh, was that doctor? What did he call it? A belief perseverance. Yeah. 
Because, you know, that's funny because we were talking about Chrysler today. And, you know, he was taking a half a milligram every two weeks. Dang and I said, it. I'm fine with that. And he said, why? I said, because you and I both know it doesn't do anything. <laughs> and, you know, half a milligram every two weeks. But but still, I think that really got in people's brains. And, you know, to go through that, I've got a real good thing that I do with with guys that are hung up on this estrogen thing to go through the history with them and they understand it. Cause there was a study. Um, I actually have it right here. Hold on. That bugger right there. Circulating estradiol and mortality in men with systolic, systolic chronic heart failure. This thing, they looked at a bunch of guys and looked at their testosterone levels and looked at their uh, survivability with their heart failure. And they came up with what was called the U-shaped curve. Right. And it was a graph that was just like this. And everybody down on the low end had a higher risk of death. And everybody on the right. high end had a higher risk of death. And everybody in the right. middle had the lowest risk of death. And that's where that 35 to 45 comes from. It comes from this study. I think it was 2009. And that's where it comes from. And I look at that and go, yes, I believe that U-shaped curve. I believe everything about it. Right. But you have to understand estrogen first. Right. And in order to understand it, and, I'll, and I'm going to save the punchline on that for a minute. Subsequently, 2010, there was a study, an, an Italian study called the Inchianti study. And there's a very well-known hormone replacement doc that owns one of the biggest pellet companies in the world that lectured on this and presented this study one time. And I was sitting in the front row and, and it showed that older Italian men with higher estradiol levels have a higher risk of metabolic syndrome. And I just raised my hand and I said, that's the Enchiante study. I said, you forgot to mention that in their conclusions, the authors said that they didn't think it was the estrogen that caused the problem. They thought it was a visceral fat. Exactly. The inflammation. And I kind of got shut down, but in that study, <laughs> they literally say that they think there's a mechanism where fat produces cytokines and the cytokines stimulate the activity of aromatase that causes right. estrogen to go up. Right. And so we know fat causes problems. Of course. So let's go back to the U-shaped curve. We know that low estrogen hurts people. And the ones oh. with high estrogen are all fat. So yes, the death is going to be on both ends, but but the estrogen is the smoke. It's not the fire. That's it's right. the innocent bystander. When your estrogen goes up, you got too much active visceral fat and you're making cytokines and leukotrienes and tumor necrosis factor and all these things that are, and you've got insulin resistance and, and all these things are causing disease, but the estrogen is just sitting there as a flag going, Hey, there's a problem here. You lower the estrogen. That's like, that's like taking a statin and lowering your cholesterol. You haven't fixed the that's problem. Right. You fixed a number. Right. And right. so when you look at these studies over and over and over again, in the baseline studies, and I know Neil talks about this, and it, and it kind of makes me crazy because you got to get Neil in order to get his teaching because he'll show you all these studies where elevated estrogen causes harm. Right. And get you all worked up. And then he shows you all these studies where elevated estrogen doesn't cause harm and it kind of confuses you. But you have to understand that baseline studies, if, if postmenopausal women and men have high estrogen levels, it only comes from one place. It comes from fat. Exactly. And when you have, and if you look at the studies, there's a clue here that people don't get. Anything that says normal men or normal women means ones that aren't fat. Exactly. Typically. That's right. That's and right. Um, when you look at giving estradiol to normal women and normal men, the risks all go down. Right. And I have study after study after study in the biochemistry literature showing reduction in risk of prostate cancer, redu reduction in, in uh, LDL, increase in HDL, reduction in risk of heart disease. Estrogen fixes everything. Cognition, more totally. estrogen. You know, and there's a reason why when we get elderly, women have a much higher risk of dementia, macular degeneration, and osteoporosis. Because these are all estrogen-related problems. When you have right. no estrogen, more dementia, more osteoporosis, more macular degeneration. If you have estrogen, you will not get macular degeneration. I reversed it in my 85-year-old mother with estrogen. That's awesome. Um, of course, the ophthalmologist said, nah, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> she called me laughing. It was funny. But 
think about it. After menopause, when your ovaries don't work anymore, you don't make estrogen. Now, if you do, it's coming from fat. But for the most part, you don't make estrogen. Right. Men make testosterone at least a little bit up until they're 90, into their 90s. Yeah. And some right. of that gets aromatized to estrogen. And so right. as long as a man's still making testosterone and long as, as long as he's still aromatizing a little bit, his risk for those things are going to go down. Right. And so that's why women have no heart disease before menopause. And after menopause, if they don't take estrogen, their heart disease risk exceeds that of men because men still have a little estrogen. The women don't and they get yeah. in trouble. Yeah. Now, one of the best, best studies I found just came around recently. Somebody finally got it. Somebody yeah, you did, sent it to me. You sent somebody me that did a study comparing estrogen levels in obese women. They only looked at obese women and they took estrogen. Which is like 70% of women in America right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shh. They'll get mad at us. Um, estrogen levels and breast cancer. And it was a perfectly inverse association. The higher the estrogen, the lower the risk of breast cancer. Right. If you look at just obese women, right? the estrogen doesn't cause the harm. The estrogen is not the problem. Now, of course, if they've got an estrogen receptor positive cancer, that's a totally different, we can't extrapolate. That's a totally different animal because estrogen causes that cancer to grow. But as soon as that cancer is gone, you got to get back on the estrogen. Right. Because the studies are showing that it reduces the risk of another one. But, and, but, but even with that, the percentage of people that could get that form of cancer are so low. But there's a lot of stuff I want to unpack that you just said. That was amazing, right. by the way. Thank you for putting that out there. I don't think that's ever been done in that way. Um, I remember in the beginning when you and I were first starting to learn this from Neil's stuff. I, I remember fat guys, and you know this, fat belt. When I say fat guys, not obese guys, but belly fat guys, right? The guys that are the testosterone takers and they're injecting, right? Remember Chrysler's got them on the you know, subcutaneous fat injecting there because they're pussies and they won't inject themselves intermuscularly with a 26 gauge needle. Go figure. So they're injecting it in their belly. And that's exactly what was happening. That was causing a cytokine storm. That testosterone was injected into that visceral body or fat body. And it literally caused a massive surge an inflammatory response. And you're right. And estrogen shot up as a result of it. And so I got estrogen side effects, bro. And, and, and as you know, it went into the whole world, bodybuilding community, performance community, clinical community. Everybody thought that there were high estrogen symptomology. And it was literally, like you just said, it was an inflammatory response. Correct. Yeah, you know, we see that in all kinds of things. You're, you're one of the first ones that uncovered this with metformin. Right. You know, people that take metformin and have a bunch of side effects are people that take metformin and have a crappy diet. Exactly. And don't, and don't, don't do anything. That's exactly you know, right. and it's a, it's the same thing with everything else. If you've got inflammation, no activity, you know, crappy diet, you're going to get side effects from anything. And, um, you know, these guys with the, you know, the gynecomastia, same you thing. know, most boys when they're going through puberty will produce some breast tissue. Right. As soon as puberty is over with that shrinks down, it doesn't go away, yeah. but it shrinks down. Yep. And then it stays the way it's supposed to until you stimulate it. Yep. And if you got a guy with a testosterone of 150 and you put him on TRT and you get him up to 900 plus, he's going to get some fluid retention. And guess what? That's going to swell up. Yep. Guess what's going to happen in three months? It's going to go back down when exactly. the fluid retention goes away. That's right. And if he starts out his diet and does some activity, it won't happen to begin with. That's right. That's all right. But you that's don't right. need an aromatase inhibitor because that's a, that's a huge problem. I got study after study after study showing the guys that take testosterone and block their estrogen production will have an increase in vascular problems, a worsening no of their lipids, no doubt. all these and other studies showing that when you don't block estrogen production, you get the same improvements in your lipids, reduction in vascular problems, reduction in cancers, reduction in dementia that you get if you were just giving estrogen. That's exactly right. And by the way, Kenny, there is nobody out there using therapeutic testosterone also concomitantly using an AI who is actually healthy. You know, I, I've talked about this, you know, and I don't want a rabbit hole, but like even with DHT inhibitors, it's the same thing, right? When you suppress right. a natural biological, let's say, let's call it, you know, God-given uh, function in the body, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. 
there is right. definitely going to be downstream bad things that happen. And we already know what DHT, you know, John bless his heart was really big and uh, you know, PFS and he understood what guys were going. I mean, look, there are some guys out there and again, I don't want to rabbit hole, but there are some guys out there and this does cr- apply to AIs. They use one, a DHT inhibitor, Kenny, for one fucking week. And two months later, they come off, right? Because they feel like shit. But two months later, they want to kill themselves. Yep. Like anybody, anybody, who even, anybody who even considers that. If somebody comes in, and, and by the way, since you've been taking your uh, your finasteride, your hair is doing really well. Um, but but no, anytime somebody comes in and goes, I might be having some hair loss. I want, you know, I want finasteride. I want something like that. Um, I tell them. <laughs> First of all, go Google post finasteride syndrome, exactly. read, read everything you can, then come back and ask me again. Tell me if you want. Bro, I mean, look, we both probably know guys. I don't want to even laugh about it because I'm laughing. I'm only laughing because of what you said. But the reality is, is that it, it literally can kill people. So mm-hmm. if we do extrapolate and this is a place to extrapolate again, you're doing the same thing with the fucking AI. And you and I both know estrogen is so necessary. I remember back in the day when you and me and Keith were bullshit and, and we didn't even know what the minimum number was, but you know, Keith had that one study where 70 right. was the minimum perfective effect in women, 70, right? So right. like these guys, they see 95, 100, 110, 120. And by the way, this isn't even for fat guys. This is just guys that are just, you know, they're really big aromatizers. And then they, you know, they go to some quack and the guy's like, oh, you know, puts them on like one milligram every other day. So I've seen guys one milligram a day. And then look, you know this, and you could talk about this, dude, you get into the single digits with estrogen and you want to fucking kill yourself again. You can't get an erection. Right. You can't think you can't sleep. You have anxiety. I mean, what could be worse? And, and dude, I've, I've seen, I've seen guys with the estrogen estradiol level less than 20. They can't get an erection with Viagra. Right. Now, these are lessons from prostate cancer. Um, men that have prostate cancer, eventually they're going to come along and go, well, you, we need to give you Lupron. And, you know, the whole testosterone prostate cancer thing is a whole other hour, uh-huh. you know, with saturation effect and all that. But if you, you drive your prostate, if you drive your testosterone significantly below 200, because if it's at 200 plus, you're at maximum risk. Right. You know, you have to get way down. Right. <laughs> and so... They drive the testosterone to zero and it slows the growth of the cancer, makes it easier to, to kill. But the guy wants to die anyway. Five times increased risk of cardiovascular disease, right. of, of dying from a heart attack. They're suicidal. They feel like crap. No quality of life. Dude. You know, it's horrible. And what we found, and again, these are lessons from prostate cancer. You can't give that guy that still got that cancer in there. You can't give him testosterone because right. it'll start to grow. Right. I'm sure we'll find a way around that at some point. Yeah. But if you give that guy estradiol, give him estrogen, he feels better. He, you know, everything gets better except his muscles and his erections. But, you know, but if he feel, feels better, his cardiovascular risk goes back he's down. Alive. He's, yeah, he's, alive. He's, he's not depressed anymore. Right. You know, one of one of my friends that I met through World Link, through Neil, um, had prostate cancer. Um he got on estradiol. He's on eight milligrams a day. His estrogen wow. levels between 400 and 500 and he feels fine. And it suppressed his PSA down to nothing because estrogen, awesome. I got studies showing estrogen kills prostate cancer. Right. You right. know, and another reason you don't want to block it, but um, the lessons from prostate cancer are, guess what? You don't have testosterone. Estrogen will make you feel good and it'll, right. it'll keep you alive. Right. You know, and uh, don't block it when you put. How, how far away for, are we from that being standard patient of care? Well, I do have a couple of oncologists that refer. They won't do it themselves because they don't know enough about it. and They're scared about it. But they refer right. to me for me to write estradiol for them. And it suppresses their PSA and it helps them feel better and all that. Um, I don't see it in, you know, anybody in MD Anderson would their head would explode. Yeah. Um, but I see that coming. Um, my cousin, my first cousin just had surgery at a prostatectomy last week and about a month and a half ago, um, his urologist told him he had prostate cancer. It was pretty high grade prostate cancer. And he told him, if you want to keep doing your testosterone, you're that's fine. That's awesome. wow. And so the, you know, some of them are coming around. Holy shit. That's amazing. All right. So what about, um, 
miss a bonus on that. Like at what level of PSA do you consider putting a guy on Esther dial? Well, it all depends. First of all, another surrogate, because there are a number of things that raise PSA. A prostate exam will raise PSA. Good reach around. <laughs> Sex will raise PSA. I know. Prostatitis will raise PSA. Testosterone raises PSA. Doesn't mean it causes cancer. Transit, yeah. And 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 prostate cancer raises PSA. What yeah. you have to look at is is rate of rise. If you go from zero to twenty one, that's P, that's prostatitis. That's not cancer. Right. Cancer will typically make you rise a point to a point and a half a year, and it will accelerate. And if you get that, I've seen guys get to four, four and a half, you know, five, and they've, they're seeing their their urologist, and the urologist is like, yep, you know, you got prostate cancer. They do the biopsy, which is totally not standard of care anymore. Um, <laughs> you've got prostate cancer. They give them the option, and now it's like, okay, now we want to do uh, androgen deprivation therapy. Fuck or no. we want to do, you know, a radical prostatectomy. I tell them, look, give me a couple months. Right. And I put them on estradiol. And if their PSA starts coming down, I have not yet seen a urologist not take notice with that positively. Oh, and your what, PSA what, would the, what would you start a dose? What would your starting dose out be on something like that for estradiol? Two milligrams. Two milligrams. Two, two milligrams? Yeah, which is the highest dose for women. Now, I used to start them at 0.5 and go to one and go to two because I was scared of it. Of course. Um, and full disclosure, on top of testosterone replacement therapy, I take two milligrams of estradiol every day because of the. Well, I was just going to. I was. I was going to extrapolate for you because, like, my uh, PSA never has ever risen. I've always been less than 0.03. Yeah. And then I just had. I just had one the other day. Uh, first in September, and it was 2.7. But. I realized I had sex, yeah. so I'm going to do another one. But I, I know that's what it was. I mean, I, that's I, what I'm it was. supposed to be fasting. And dude, you know how it is when you're in your 50s, you take it when you can get it, bro. Even if you got to schedule blood test, you know. So, you know, <laughs> stop, dude. but no, dude, I was sold, and I was like, what the fuck? And then I started thinking about it, and I was like, oh shit, you know. But but so but that's a good point. Like from a preventative maintenance standpoint, what should be the dosage for a guy who's super proactive? Well, like I said, I'm taking two milligrams a day. I haven't checked my estradiol level because I don't check it. Um, I don't typically yeah, don't check them. If somebody asks me about it, I kind of begrudgingly check it, and then I have to explain to them why it's not important. But um, <laughs> on testosterone, mine typically was running slightly over 100, and then I added two milligrams of estradiol. I imagine I'm running 150, 160, but zero. do this for a few years. Zero yeah. side effects. Yeah. Great lipids. No, Honestly, PSA. dude, I think I'm going to have you write me a script for it and I'll just do an experiment and we'll, 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 we'll put it out there and we'll do it. But I mean, obviously I've been hearing you, I've been hearing Keith, I've been hearing a lot of guys, you know, talk about the benefits of this. And I'm just thinking, you know, if you do have, uh, you know, a genetic predisposition to prostate or colon, colon cancer, you know, that type of stuff as a man in your family, I would think that it would be an amazing, just preventative adjunct to start using it. Absolutely. Plus, other than estradiol, which there aren't any, you know, aren't any real good studies with estradiol and prevention, of course. Yeah. Because nobody's doing that yet. But we're not smart enough. The, the number one, you know, we're kind of getting off the subject, but the number one thing that's going to prevent prostate cancer is keeping your vitamin D levels up. That's right. That's and, right. Uh, you know, low vitamin D is a huge risk factor for prostate cancer. So there's no doubt. And I, I literally on my labs, my vitamin D was over a hundred, they're like, what the fuck are you doing? I'm like, I take 10,000 IUs of the good shit every day. And I get in this sun living in almost San Diego. So, but yeah, dude, that's a whole nother podcast. Okay. So I've been going here for an hour and a minute. Uh, let's talk a little bit about thyroid and then mention the physiologic pharmacologic. You're good on time right now, right? Sure. Okay. Um, so thyroid, again, the exact same thing. Thyroid's another extrapolation. And specifically this, um, the diagnosis of quote unquote hyperthyroidism. There's one thing that typically causes it other than a pituitary issue, but one disease typically causes your thyroid to be overactive and it's Graves disease. Graves disease is an autoimmune disease. I think we all kind of have a little bit of an 
idea of how thyroid works. You know, the pituitary makes TSH, thyroid right. stimulating hormone, right. and stimulates the thyroid to make hormones. Right. Well, there's a feedback mechanism, and when you make enough hormone, the TSH slows down, and it's like your pituitary is a thermostat, and your thyroid's a heater. It keeps it all in the in perspective. But what happens with Graves' disease is somebody puts a space heater in the room. Graves' disease, you produce a um, an autoimmune complex called TSI, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin. And it stimulates the thyroid just like TSH. And there is no feedback because the thyroid can't shut it off because it doesn't come from the pituitary. It's an, it's an immune complex. And so you produce more and more and more thyroid and you get hyperthyroid. And because you're producing more and more thyroid, your pituitary is trying to shut it off. And so your, your TSH goes to zero. And here's where the shit show begins. Because now every time I give somebody thyroid hormone and get them feeling well and their TSH approaches zero, everybody's head explodes. Oh my gosh, you're going to give them osteoporosis. You're going to give them atrial fibrillation. You're going to, you know, again, there are studies in Graves' disease where you take their thyroid hormones and get them back down to normal and they still have osteoporosis and Graves' disease. It's not the thyroid hormone, it's the autoimmunity. And so, you know, we could do two hours on thyroid, but it's another extrapolation. You know, thyroid hormone is not harmful. I have a lot of patients on a lot of thyroid hormone. Most of them have their TSH down at zero. Um, right. They all feel great. They all take their full dose of thyroid and they don't have tachycardia and their blood pressure doesn't go up and their eyes don't bug out and they feel fantastic and their lipids get better and their insulin resistance improves. And, you know, all of these oh, hormones. Oh, I, gotta stop you. I gotta ask you this question. Um, of course, you know, I'm in agreement with you. Why do doctors not understand that what you just said? You know, I always say it like this, like you're going to optimize hormones. You got to optimize the pancreas, pituitary, and of course, thyroid is a master regulation gland. Why are they not, why are they so afraid to, to not optimize the thyroid at the same time they're optimizing the hormones. I mean, where is the confusion coming from? Well, because in medical school, we're taught the exact thing I was just telling you. When your TSH is, is suppressed, right, you are going to have all these problems. Sure. And then after medical school, nobody reads anything. Other than the free journal that's sent to them by the medical society that they belong to that reinforces all the stuff you learn in medical school. And, right. you know, I, I had the opportunity, I was, I was teaching in Dallas a couple of years ago. And I had the opportunity to sit down with two female physicians. One was a, a rheumatologist and one was a gastroenterologist. And I got a chance to sit and talk with them. And I said, look, I have this idea that, you know, in, in medical training, this is what happens, you know, as a paramedic, you learn algorithms. If right. this, do this. If this, do this. Don't think about right. it. Right. And then when you get to medical school, you start learning basic science. So here's how it works. Oh, that's great. In your third year, you try to apply the basic science to patient care. Sure. In your fourth year, you kind of push the basic science aside and you hone your patient care skills right. based on these um, procedures and policies you've learned that should be based on the, on the science. And then in residency, it goes a little further. And I was talking to these ladies and, I, and to the rheumatologists particularly because they're so inundated with new stuff all the time. Right. And I said, I have a suspicion that when you get to specialty training, it's much like paramedic training again. They give you algorithms and tell you, follow the algorithm, don't think about it. And she said, you're absolutely correct. They tell us that there's so much medical literature, it's so contradictory that we should not take the time to sift through it, that they will sift through it for us and tell us what's important. And depending on who's sifting, that can be a problem. Right, right. If someone has an agenda, and I'm not saying they do, but that can be a problem. It's very easy for someone to go, well, that doesn't apply, this doesn't apply, do this. There's no and agenda with Big Pharma, bro, come on. And no. we just don't have time to do this Plus, when we graduate from, from medical school and residency, they go, look, here's your MD. You're a medical deity now. Um, <laughs> nobody knows, you know, and, and I was thinking about this the other day. If you go through and look at the and look at all the characteristics of a cult, 
You have a special revelation that only you know, nobody else knows. Don't listen to somebody else because they're going to poison you. Dude, this is how they teach us. It's unbelievable. You just said the medical, you're a medical deity. In my terms, it's the lab coat God, but it's the same thing. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, if you're doing residency in a, in a, in a high, high end medical institution and you mention something about a chiropractor, everybody's going to roll their eyes. Right. I've exactly. learned so much, so much from chiropractors. Oh, the best. And people, yeah. and people who do natural medicine and, you right, know, of course. there's nothing wrong with learning. If, if you can't look at the other side for fear of losing something, then, you know, you don't have anything. The only way to reinforce the knowledge we have is to look at all the sides and say, no, I'm still right. Dude, yeah. I want to go deeper with you right now and something that you and I, you and I would probably get this fucking video deleted, so I won't. But let's ju sure. just briefly mention physics, and I'll bring you back on and we'll talk this. And sure. I might, you and me and Keith are going to do, do, do something I, I, Keith sent me an email or a text message the other day. And he says, you know, let Kenny know that I want to do a, I can't even remember what it was. He's had COVID. I told you that, but he was like, I want to do a, a facts and fallacies again. And I'm like, perfect. Uh, so physiologic versus pharmacologic dosing of hormones in just a couple of minutes. Right. And I just, little, sent this to Keith. I just sent this to Keith this morning and said, Hey, here's my evidence for this. We need to blow this up because it's a new paradigm and it'll change everything. Yeah, no. And I'll have you guys on literally probably next week. But just sure. mention it, just just let the appetite. So everybody talks about bioidentical hormone replacement. Right. And when you talk about replacement, you, re you replace the lost hormone. And right. the hard part is we just got the mainstream to stop thinking we're quacks for replacing the lost hormone. Now, now we're gonna go another step. Right. And so Rebecca Glazer, who's one of the one of the biggest, she's a retired breast oncology surgeon. She's one of the biggest researchers in female hormones. And I, there's a, a study that she did, and it actually looks at pellets in women, and it looks at numbers. And I've I've referenced this study hundreds of times. I've talked to patients about it hundreds of times. And about two weeks ago, I looked at the title and went, "Oh my gosh, I missed that." And it was testosterone implants in women pharmacological dosing for a physiologic effect. And in this, she talks about, you know, after pellets, the women that feel well, their average testosterone level is 299, ranging somewhere from 200 to 600. And when the pellets start wearing off and they come back, back in going, I need a dose, right. that average number is 171. I'm and if you look at the reference range for testosterone levels for women, it's less than 55. Right. which means zero is normal. Yep. And I was going to chuckle out of them. And I know that I'm getting to them when I say that. So how do you justify going above that? Because my question is, do teenage women get to 300? No. Do any women get to 300 naturally? No. Well, how do you justify it? And she does. And she goes in and says, look, much like insulin, right, which is another natural hormone, we don't give insulin to a diabetic and then check their insulin level to see if it's in the normal range. We look to see what their blood sugar is. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we have studies that say this much insulin isn't going to kill you and it's beneficial. So let's use it. And that's exactly what Rebecca did in this. And she said, look, these, these women are getting improvements in well-being, improvements in sexual desire. They're getting improvements in their, in their lipids. They're getting lean muscle. They're losing visceral fat and they're having no long-term significant medical adverse side effects. And so pharmacological dosing, dose it like a drug, dose it like insulin, give them a dose and achieve a level that gives them a beneficial outcome without harm. And this is, I call this a new paradigm because every single guideline that we fight on hormone replacement talks about hormone replacement. And this is not right. hormone replacement. This is dosing a hormone like a drug. And if I can't do this, you can't use insulin anymore. I mean, dude, just replace it. Just replace the word. It's just, it's optimization. It's like, you know, you and Keith and Neil, you dose them until they feel fucking good. Right. Who gives a shit what the test level or, you know, whatever the levels are, if they feel good and there's an absence of side effects or symptomology. Right. I mean, it's, now, it's so we, simple. We've, but, we've always used optimization kind of, you know, in order to keep ourselves out, out of trouble, we kind of use optimization right. as let's push to the upper limits of normal or slightly phys super physiologic right. without harm. 
slightly. Um, but you know, when you're talking about bringing a, a female's level to 300 on average, which is six times the upper limit of normal, you gotta you gotta have a new way of saying that, and a new you know. Because Kenny, the way I would look at it, hold on, I gotta stop you. The way I would look at it is is if it's your wife or your girlfriend, if she's telling you that she wants you to you know what, it's probably working pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Right? Yep. I mean, right. Guy, again, again, one of the things one of the things that Keith said that they were doing at this uh andrology meeting was all these experts were were putting up pictures of these ripped guys and talking about you know, sexual performance and laughing at it. And it's I'm like, really no, how many, how many studies show that the more sex you have, the longer you live? That's exactly and what's right. wrong with reducing visceral fat and increasing lean muscle? Because every study shows you live longer. You know, it, what is wrong with that? Keith was, Keith was pretty upset about it. Uh, and it probably actually lowered his immune system so that he got the big C. Kenny, man, amazing podcast today if somebody watches this when they watch this and they want to reach out to you and connect with you what is the best way they can do that uh best way to find me is my website uh www.optimushealth.com right there yep um it's got phone numbers on there um the easiest but, way you, that, you can just uh, go through the comp you can just be contacted directly through the web yeah and the and um I'm not sure the contact link works on that website, but if you text the office number, yep. we will get your message. Are you able to, before you get those questions, are you able to work with people, you know, anywhere in the United States from a, a, well, a I live in Texas. perspective? I live in Texas. Keith will tell you that's bad news. Yep. Um, here's what I can do. I can consult with anybody uh, as far as prescribing, you know, there's, there's nothing that says I can't give medical advice to anybody anywhere. As far as prescribing, we can make that happen. I, I have to really look into, um, you know, as far as if a telemedicine visit is good enough for me to give a prescription for a controlled substance like right. testosterone in another state. Um, I do know that Neil has done this for years, that if you lay eyes on someone in your state one time, exactly. you can probably treat them forever. Uh, anybody, no, there's ways around it. There's, anybody there's, in the Texas area, certainly, because I don't know if we got anybody else in Texas right now, but... Um, Sure, I'm available. Okay, awesome, man. Well, dude, this was phenomenal. Uh, like I said, I'll bring you and Keith and me on and we will talk about that. And then I think I said, I think it's going to be more of like a FAQ because again, the stupidity, it just never seems to go away. But man, thank you so much for coming on. So guys, support yeah, the right. amazing people that come on the Jay Campbell podcast. Go to his website. It's Optimus. What was it again? Optimus Health? OptimusHealth.com. Yep, OptimusHealth.com. If you're a man or a woman and you are interested in optimizing your hormones, I mean, if you listen to this podcast, he's easily one of the best out there. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys very soon.